In this episode, I'm going to be joined by a new friend of the podcast, Heidi Rogers. She is a psychotherapist working out of Australia. My name is Justin Sinceri. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. Welcome to Stuck Not Broken. Some disclaimers. Number one, this is not specific life advice. Number two, this is not therapy. Number three, there. this is not all-encompassing. There could very well be things that Heidi and I miss in our discussion here. These are our immediate thoughts on the on the sub- subjects. And this is, well, this is not a disclaimer, but this is part one. Next week, we will finish up with part two. So you're going to get part of one of the stories here. We're going to go through a whole bunch of bad therapy examples in this one, but one of them gets cut off and then next week we'll be able to finish it up with part two. Welcome to the bad therapy series. I don't do these very often, but I like doing them a lot. I think it's so, so, so important that I do these and I'm glad to have you be a part of this. Um, The only people who've ever had an issue with this are other therapists. I hear from people, (laughs) clients, pretty frequently like, hey, thank you so much for doing these. So there, there's a, like a, I think there's a need for it, for people to get clarity about therapy, what they're going into, what are norms, and we're going to go over some not norms. You ready for it? Yep. Hit me. I'm ready. All right. So you're, you're up for anything. You said, so we're going to do kind of a mixture here. Uh, and these are all, none of these are stories. I don't think they're pretty quick. Mm-hmm. So we'll do a mixture here. Okay. All right. The first okay. one's just, it's just one line. It says, Told I no longer needed therapy when I, in in full caps, really needed help. That's it. So told I no longer needed therapy when I really needed help. What are your immediate thoughts on that? Or I can go first if you'd like, but what are your immediate thoughts? What pops in your mind there? I find it weird when a clinician decides whether or not the therapy should end. Yeah. How the hell can a therapist know what's going on in someone's mind and body? Like, I just think that's a real, blah. that's concerning to me. Because I think, how do you know? Like, a therapist doesn't know. I mean, how many, like, I've had clients, you've had clients, we've all had clients that present fine and they have session after session that it's just, you're kind of like, why are yeah. they here? And it doesn't feel like we're really, what are we doing? And then, but you know, it's fifth true. session yeah. in or 10th session in some, you know, grenade explodes. And then you're like, Oh, that's why we're here. But I think a lot of times it takes people a while to get comfortable, even just in the space or sharing that you can't, I don't think a clinician. And I also think that makes me feel like that's not a collaborative relationship. I think right. therapy is like you go, I go, we, you know, we sort of hit the ball yeah. back and forth. I find that, yeah, that sucks. I feel bad for that person. That was my immediate thought too, was that this is a decision that's made together. It should, I don't think it should be, it sounds like you you agree that like, it shouldn't be like me saying you're done. This is something we talk about together. And now what, let's talk about, about like what, what is within the norm then? So for me, within the norm would be like me noticing, hey, you're doing better. You're meeting the goal that we created on the treatment plan, the goal of therapy. It seems like you're doing better than motion regulation, whatever it is, like you're at a good baseline. Let's start talking about winding down therapy or tapering off or whatever it looks like, whatever ending looks like. That to me is well within the norm of what ending therapy could look like, not me or the therapist announcing, hey, we're done. Absolutely. I think what I usually do with people too is wind down. Like, so if we're weekly, we go to fortnightly. If we're fortnightly, we go to monthly, you know, that kind of thing. What is fortnightly? Oh, sorry. Every two weeks. (laughs) I forget that. (laughs) We have weird words. They have weird stuff here, man, that they say things different. And it's so like, when I first got here, I would have to like Google stuff because I was like, what does that even mean? Like, and it's because they have a lot of British, like they use British English a lot. So yeah, they say fortnightly and like the letterbox and the chemist and stuff like that <laughs> tell us what those are later on <laughs> i'm really curious about that too now but let's focus it so yeah it might be every other week but you're yeah. basically tapering off and just kind of seeing hey if we go a longer stretch of time how do we do how do we handle that pretty yes. typical and all right i think it's key word is negotiation compromise yeah. collaborative decision you know like we come to it together and i think sometimes people don't realize how well they're going and so sometimes i'll say like i'll sort of joke in a session when i say like how's the week been or whatever and they are saying like it's this has been great and that's been good and i'll kind of go like this and go 
why are we here? You know, like, <laughs> dude, you're doing great. This is awesome. Yeah. Like, it's yeah. a good thing to not need to check in with me, you know, once a week. Like, that's so exciting. Like, what if we try to go to yeah. seeing each other every other week or once a month and just see how that is? And oftentimes I think it's that safety of knowing I have my appointment with Heidi. And I say, like, I send my reminders out three days in advance. That's plenty of time for me to fill it. So why don't we just see three days in advance? You just let me know if you if you need it, if you don't. And then you can just reply to the text reminder, yes or no. And then if you don't need it, cool. And then let's just see how that happens. And that usually is like, then they'll have a few of those where they go, oh, yeah, I don't need it. I'm okay. I'm okay. So yeah, like, tr- gradual, gradual. Yeah. Okay. seems like you and I pretty much agree on that. I mean, that's well within the norms of what to expect, not a quick you're done. What concerns me about this, and I mean, you picked it up on as well, was I? she said, or actually, I don't know, she, he, they said, I really needed help in all capitals. So how a therapist does not see that. I mean, if, if someone's not telling us, sure. But uh, you sh- I would, a therapist should be checking in on the goal of treatment in every session, in my opinion. And seeing how things are going, as long as the client's being open and honest about it, then that should be kind of known, I would think. So for someone who really needed help in all capital letters, that concerns me to be cut off from therapy. I think it's important to to understand shame, right? So like all my clients would just be laughing right now when they listen to this about, oh, Heidi and shame again. It's like I talk about it all the time. And I think that when you've talked about shame, early on in therapy. And then subsequently, like, I mean, I think I would probably mention the word shame in every session with clients just about that there is often a lot of shame in my quote unquote failure. Or, you know, like if I go to session, I had a client say this to me a couple of weeks ago. Um, she's like, I feel shame and I feel bad when I come to therapy and I don't report any improvements or I report mm. that I'm doing the same or worse. And so we had a really good conversation about um, you know, fearing like my judgment or that she's like a bad client and she's not getting better. And that, you know, we have some sort of secret clinician club where we sit there and talk about our clients that aren't getting better quick enough, you know? (laughs) And, um, I sort of like, I, I laughed like endearing, like, oh, honey child, like, no, not at all. Like it's not linear and it's three steps forward and two steps back. And I would be concerned if every session you came just like, you know, saying how great things were going, like, ugh. so I think, yeah, I would, I would sort of, right, I guess, right, get, right. get curious if a client said everything's great, you know, with like a plastic smile, I would be a little bit like, what is that? Are you feeling shame that there's something like, have you relapsed and you don't want to talk about it? Or I would sort of dig a little bit. So that also sends red flags to me about that clinician that they didn't kind of dig a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't disagree with you about anything you said. I don't think really anything to add to that. Um, but basically, I guess just reiterating, there probably isn't going to be radical change week to week. It is completely fine to say nothing changed or minimal change. Like that's completely okay yes. and nothing to be embarrassed about. And it's not just true for clients. It's true for all of us, whether we're in therapy totally. or not. Totally. I mean, the number of times that I sit with my therapist and I go, how am I still talking about my family? <laughs> you know, like <laughs> all of us, every clinician out there, yeah. like like we all dip in and out of therapy. We all like are constantly a work in progress. It's the same themes. It's the same stuff that comes up. Like that's just part of being human, you know? I do not disagree. All right, well, so we started off light. Mm-hmm, okay. We'll, 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 go, <laughs> we'll go to another light one here. In okay. this one, oh man, I don't know, you... I'll be honest here, okay? Okay. Another one sentence. Okay. Uh, the one sentence is, she kept yawning as I was talking. Ooh. So, not a good look. I'll be 100% honest. I've been there. And it has nothing to do with my clients being boring. Sometimes I'm just tired. Mm-hmm. And especially at noon, that's like I know that's my tired time. And I really start to <laughs> dip into like... Mm-hmm. I don't know what it is, tiredness, fatigue, whatever it is. Like that's my nap time, my natural nap time, mm-hmm. I think. So I know for me <laughs> that they, hopefully a client doesn't pick up on like that I'm just kind of like slowing down, yeah. you know? And they used to be worse. It's gotten gotten better. It probably had a lot to do with like diet and what I was eating, how much I was eating. Yeah. And I've been eating yeah. like light, lighter lunches now. And I've noticed that I don't feel as heavy, you know? I've, I can eat less and I'm, I'm, I feel fine. 
And so that pro I feel less heaviness and my body seems to mm. be working less mm. to like process whatever, you know, metabolize or whatever. Mm. So it has nothing to do with my clients though. Mm. So I, I'll take, I'll play devil's advocate here. I don't okay. think this is like radically out of the norm. I think that it is not necessarily a reflection of the client at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've had clients that I find absolutely fascinating and I love hearing everything they have to say, but at that time of day, I'm just, I struggle. Mm -hmm. So I'll put that out there mm -hmm. as a, as kind of like a devil's advocate kind of thing. But what pops up for you when you hear she kept yawning as I was talking? I totally agree with you that it's not, it's not indicative of how much we like you or think you're boring or whatever. It's, I think oftentimes the time of day for me, it's like two or three in the afternoon that you will catch me yawning. And all those clients that are at that time, I will say to them, because I want to, just yeah yeah ma manage their expectations i guess that if i yawn it's not because of you it's because my blood sugar just drops and sometimes i've even had some clients where at the beginning of the session i'm like still finishing a granola bar like chewing yeah. in between cuz you know if my <laughs> gap was only 5 minutes and i couldn't finish it enough and i'll say i'm so sorry that i'm finishing this granola bar right now but i just had to finish i had to get some sugar into me to keep my blood sugar up or i'll have a glass of orange juice or something to help spike so that i'm not snoozing but yeah definitely and also it's the end of the day like you know if we're seeing 6 7 people back to back or it's sometimes on those days, definitely, you know, it's like I've just been sitting, being fully engaged with people for, you know, hour increments that, yeah, you. it's hard to keep. I think it's your nervous system, really, that you're trying to keep engaged the whole time. But it's not a reflection totally. at all. No. Yeah. So it, that's not uh, out of the norm. It seems like we, we agree that, that that could be a possibility. Does it not necessarily have to be a reflection of the client at all? I would I would yeah. lean toward typically not. Mm. There is uh, one person who wrote saying, I had one that fell asleep while I was talking multiple times. That's probably different. That's yeah. somebody else. So that's another bad that's therapy. Different. Just short story there. That's bad. Yeah. That's not good. So that, same that person, to me says that, that you, sorry, that says to me though, that if, if I was feeling that tired, right? Like I think about when my kids were smaller, like when they were babies and I was having a lot oh, of sleep yeah. nights. Oh yeah. In that stage. But what I would have done is I would have just, um, messaged my PA and said, dude, you got to clear my calendar for today because I'm not going to be a good therapist today because I'm just too tired and sleep deprived. So that's, I think that's what, a, if you're that tired that you think you might fall asleep in session, cancel your clients, dude, or like do a half day. Like that's what I've done too. And some days it's like I've slept in to make up for the bad night and then gone in at noon and seen my afternoon clients. But yeah, if it's happening multiple times, that's concerning. Yeah, that is different. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I, I remember the kids being born and being up a couple times a night. And uh, yeah, it definitely affects you throughout the day. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So that, that same person who said that I had one that fell asleep while I was talking multiple times. Okay. That same person goes on to say in couples therapy, the therapist told me to take my husband quote unquote at his word. And then the person says he was cheating. So the therapist said, take him out of his word. And it ends up that this person was being cheated on. I just, do you know what I find weird? is like when, when clinicians are that directive, like right, to be yeah. like, this is what you need to do. You need to take him out of his word is like, huh? Like, I don't know. That doesn't sit right with me. That's where I went to. Um, I, I, I am very, I haven't done couples therapy. I, I've done a lot of family therapy. I love doing family therapy. And I can be directive as far as like, uh, it feels like I'm orchestrating or conducting a symphony, but it's like, I'm really kind of like helping two people. Like I just saw, was it yesterday? I helped the dad and his son to communicate. Mm. And it was really like, did you know, this person spoke right now, dad, did you hear what he said? And can you repeat back? Like, I'll be really directive in that way. Yes. But I don't, I don't think yeah. I've ever told someone like, just take them at their words or they'll be fine or whatever it is that I, I haven't done. That seems... It's like, I think that conducting or being directive and holding structure is okay, but giving advice or telling people how to take things outside of session or how they should think or feel. And really that's kind of what this therapist is doing is saying, this is what you, this is how you should think. So believe, take him out his word that, that seems to me to be crossing the line. 
And also we get such a snapshot, like therapy right. is such a like tiny, tiny piece of the, the whole picture for people that it's never a good like sign. I think if someone who sees you for an hour a week or, you know, two, you know, once every two weeks, like there's 168 hours in a week, 336 in two weeks. Right. So it's like, yeesh, this person who has this tiny little one hour of 168 and they yeah. not. Nah, yeah. To nah. sort of say like, yeah, just believe him or take him at his word or uh, yeah. that. Yeah. Like there's so much going on that we don't have knowledge of to be given that kind of advice. Right. I don't give advice at all as a, yeah, at all. I, I, I can comfortably say I don't give advice at all. I can definitely go over options with clients and help them weigh pros and cons and look at, uh, especially because they're so maybe stuck in like a defensive state that, you know, there are more options here. Let's, you know, slow down and then come back and think about things. But I never say like, this is how you should do things. Do this, do that. Yeah. I'll encourage only people way it... to like go to school. I encourage them yeah. to yeah. <laughs> not commit sure. crimes. The, the, yeah. the, my students that I work with that are living a certain lifestyle. But be, yeah. you know, beyond that, I'm, I'm not giving a whole lot of advice. Yeah, yeah, agreed. I think the only place that I found where I do more advicey stuff is parenting, because that's uh, where they'll be like, when my kid's having a tantrum, what do I do? And that's more of like a break it down, like, you know, don't hit them, don't threaten, I'm going <laughs> to lock you in a true. room, you know, like, let's not do those things. But true. I'll go the more like advicey route, which is weird, because I'm not used to that with, because you're right, with therapy, it's more like, what do you think about that? How does that feel in your body? You know, like, it's more like... <laughs> Kind of going around it, but parenting stuff is a lot more right. like, you Parents know. Parents want to know. Boom, like boom. They, they want to have the oh, answer. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We, yeah. We don't have time. I just, just tell me how do you want to do. I don't want to live like this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, I used to do a lot of parenting groups and they would, uh, I would be up there and here's my rationale for parenting and we don't control our kids. And then right away, it's like, well, what if this happens? And what if that happens? And they yeah. want to know, bam, bam, bam. And have you lived this life? Do you know what it's like? And of course I haven't yeah. lived everyone's life. <laughs> But like parents want to know exactly what to do. Yeah. And that's what sometimes I'll do like um, I have a Q&A call twice a week with the parenting program I have that's part of the program is a and a call every week. And sometimes parents that are new will ask something like, um, how do I stop yelling at my kids? And I'm like, mm, <laughs> like how much time right, do we right, have, right, dude? Right, 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 yeah. That's such a big question. Yeah. Or like, how how do I get my kid to open up to me more? And it's just like, I, it, when I first started doing the parenting programs, it was like, how do I answer like a six hour question in yeah. six minutes, you know? Right. And so right. sometimes, or in public speaking engagements, when I do like a, um, a, a seminar or something, and I do Q&A at the end, someone will, you know, raise their hand and go, so if my kid is... Um, sneaking out or doing drugs how do i handle that and it's right. like again wow we have a that's a big answer for you know a 10 yeah. minute q a yeah okay yeah so generally no advice giving sounds like we yeah. we, we kind of agree on that okay all right this yeah. one's got a little more meat to it mm -hmm. you're not a vegetarian are you mm -mm. if so then it has more greens or, or seeds <laughs> i don't know all right so this one the person says hey i just wanted to thank you so me just want to thank you for your episodes on bad therapy. You've given me the courage and the knowledge to move on from my therapist after she crossed some of my boundaries. I started listening to your podcast a while ago after reading the Deb Dana book on the political theory. And I have to say, I really enjoy your podcast and have been rec This is all, sorry, this is just me like reading praise <laughs> to myself. <laughs> You're awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and have been recommending it to everyone I know, including my boundary crossing therapist. That's Pretty awesome. I wonder if that came before or after the boundary crossing. That's interesting. And they say, I'm going to be emailing her and letting her know. Oh, okay. I'm going to be emailing her and letting her know I'm going to be seeking help elsewhere and I will be letting her know why. So first off, there's more to it, but that's pretty awesome, I think. Mm, so totally. high five, high five to that person. Yes. Um, but yeah, first off, like I, I think clients should be totally expecting the best for themselves, right? Like why don't need to settle. You don't need to settle. I, you do deserve the best therapist that you can get. I, I, so I love that this person's willing to, to do that. Yeah. I always say to people, when you're looking for a therapist, you want to try to find someone who you would have a coffee with. You mm. want it to be someone who you feel comfortable with 
you enjoy their company. You don't feel judged. You don't feel um, shamed. You feel like they like you, like just someone who you'd have a coffee with. So think about the people in your life that you go, yeah, I'd like to have a coffee with them or no, I wouldn't have a coffee with them. If you're, if the answer when you think, like if you have one session with someone and then you're like, I don't think I'd want to have a coffee with them. It's like, that's your, that's your answer then because that's not, and I'm not saying that we're friends that, you know, a clinician client relationship is different. We're not buds, but it should feel more on the, like we're buddies end of the spectrum than, you know, there's there's, there should be warmth to it. Yeah. And that you want to go like, um, when, People have told me about past clinicians before and how they would dread it and how they'd feel anxious before. Definitely think like sometimes when you know you're going to have a, you're going to talk about something big or something that was traumatic or, you know, you're kind of holding something in your mind that you're going to bring to therapy that week. Totally makes sense that you'd feel anxious. So you would be a bit like, oh, I want to cancel. But I think there's a, a difference that when you are going You know, if you know your appointment's coming and you're just like, I don't really like it. I'm not really getting anything out of it. Move on because it's not supposed to be like that. Good therapy is I feel heard. I feel seen. I feel like they like me. Um, I feel, you know, like the unconditional positive regard. They feel that we like them. Yeah. Yeah. No matter what I say, whatever what I bring, that they will hold me in high esteem and see the good in me. I worked with a, a coach and I genuinely look forward to I think each of our sessions, I don't think I ever dreaded it. Um, and she did all those things, but I loved how challenging she was at the same time. Like she did not let me get away with much. You know what I mean? Like she really challenged. And when I was challenging back, she could like roll with it really well. So I liked that about her a lot. Like that was really awesome. So it's not just like, it, part of it is that warm, cozy kind of feeling, I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But all, it can also be that uh, like, more hard nosed, I could be challenging, but from a loving, you know, kind of place. Yeah, like a sparring, kind of like it's mm, a friendly sparring or a friendly spent can tennis be, yeah. match. Yeah, if that's what you want and if that's helpful. Right. Um, I've definitely yeah. had clients that have said to me when I've um, been challenging in the conversation that have said to me, that didn't feel nice. I didn't like you doing that. And that's been really great conversation to go, okay, so when I kind of play the devil's advocate, or if I say what that might've been like from the other person's perspective, you know, that, that felt, um, upsetting or whatever. And yeah, I've definitely had those. And those are hard sessions, I think for people to have, um, not necessarily as a clinician, but I think for the client to, say, cause there's the weird power dynamic in therapy, you know, there's the like, Oh, they yeah. know more than I do. I can't push back. And I'm always like, hell yeah, you can push back. Tell me if you think what I just said was stupid. Tell me if you think what I just said made no sense. Or did that feel like I was shaming you? You know, tell me, I want to know. And that's often a really great, like, um, practice ground. I often say to people, you want to feel like therapy is your practice space to practice these new skills of like asserting myself or asking for what I want or what I need. Um, yeah, I think that is so good when people can do that, but it's hard. If your clients can bring that up and say, Hey, I didn't feel safe. Like that's awesome. That shows a lot about the relationship, you know, but that's something I do a lot at the, at pretty much the beginning of every session or every, um, the first time I meet with the client, I'm telling them off the bat, it is always okay to give me feedback. It is, you will not hurt my feelings. Uh, it was always, if I'm doing something terrible, let me know if I'm doing something great, that's fine too. Uh, and then regularly I will check in with them at the end of the session saying, Hey, how did this go for you? Anything that I could do better next time. So I, I think that clients should be looking for those kinds of openings, uh, invitations, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I like to ask too, when we start our next session, I like to start with, so how was that for you after you left the office? There you go. What yeah. was that like? You know, were you, yeah. did you leave my room feeling like cut open and your trauma spilling out or did it feel like, no, we kind of put it back in and, and sort of organized it a little bit for next time. Or what was that like for you afterwards? Did anything come up for you that night afterwards? And oftentimes that's when they'll say things like, um, I, you know, I felt shame or I felt whatever. And then you can kind of unpack some of the other stuff that they, and I don't think a lot of clinicians ask that. I don't think a lot of people ask, what's this like for you right now? You know, or like the in the moment stuff of like, yeah. 
Oh, I just saw you clench your jaw there. What was that? Are you, was that irritating what I just said, you know? Did you actually see me clench my jaw? No. You weren't, okay. a lot. Right. No, but you know how sometimes oh God, you see that? like right through me. No, but you know how sometimes in a session you can just see, ooh, yeah, I just totally. said something that hit a nerve. And so I'm, I'll always call it and go, oh, dude, did you see what your body just did there? What was that? I just saw that big breath or I saw that yeah. you disconnected or um, you shifted your energy. What was that? And I always try to sort of shift it to the body or the brain or um, – not you, but like, oh, how interesting how your nervous system just reacted to that. I wonder what that was about. And that in the moment discussion about what's happening in the room, I think is so important. It's really important. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So this person goes on. Yeah. After they were done praising me and thank you for sitting through that. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> You're a good clinician and a good podcaster. So it's there nice you go. to hear. All right. All right. They go on to say, she's not the worst therapist. She's helped me a lot. Okay. I just don't want her using my quotes in a book she said she's going to write about what her clients say. What do you think? Let me let you sit with that one for a moment. <laughs> Are you writing a book about your clients? Do you, do you uh, take notes about them in session with a book in mind? Do you write down their I'm, quotes? No. No, I, okay. No, I don't write down their quotes, but... I am going to be writing a book next year. And I've thought a lot about this with um, people whose books that I've read, clinicians whose books that I've read, where they draw on case studies and examples, right? Yeah. Like say um, Dr. Shafali Saburi in her books, A Conscious Parent, she talks a lot about dynamics between a parent and a child. And a parent and a child came into my office and da 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 and she's changed their names and probably their genders and some of the yeah, stories yeah. or whatever to make it de-identified. But like Bruce Perry, Bessel van der Kolk, like all the gurus that I subscribe to, Peter Levine in trauma work, always talk about, you know, Nancy. And they talk about the clients that came in and they share their stories. So I think if a clinician is going to write a book, I think... If you're going to talk about clients, I still, even if they were de-identified, I still would feel more comfortable to discuss it with a client. But where I think it gets tricky is is in the power dynamic thing, right? For because sure. Because I think if, if I hold the power as a clinician, and I don't feel that way, I think that's what it feels like as a client. Um, but I guess it's like we know it's there, so I can't like pretend it's not there or ignore it. I feel like if I ask you, hey, Justin, I'm writing a book about um, whatever, and I wanted to use a few anecdotes from our sessions in the book, that even having that conversation feels tricky to me because I'm like, well, you're like, if I know that you're a recovering people pleaser, you're probably going to say yes because you feel like you have to. So I feel like even if so, if I was going to write a book, well, I am going to write a book, but in that, I'm still trying to work out how I'm going to have those conversations with people. And even if I de-identify or I change the gender or I change the, it wasn't a car accident, it was a train accident. I still feel like I don't want my clients to read my book and go, that's mm -hmm. me. Right. Or is that me? I right. feel like I would want to say to them, hey, Bob, I was going to put in that um, story you told me about the car accident. I was going to put that in the book, but I was going to change it to Janet and I was going to change it to a train, you know, is that or whatever. Or I don't know. I feel like I would want to de-identify it maybe so much that people can't see themselves. I don't know. What do you think? I'm right with you. It's a it's I don't think it's as far as I know, I'm not sure what the ethical norm is around this. I haven't looked that deeply into this, but I would I would I talk about client my client work every now and then on the podcast i'll use specific examples and mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. my blog or whatever so i i engage in that i do the best i can to strip it of anything that's identifiable and i know that some of my coworkers, as far as teachers or social workers or other therapists they listen to my podcast so if i share a story about a student in their class there's a really good chance they'll know who i'm talking because like, you know, like these behaviors can be so specific or the outburst or the history of a, of a client can be so specific. So I, I, in my mind, I'm like, somebody will be able to identify this person. You know, I'm like, I just assume they will. So I do the best I can to take away any identifiers and make it unrecognizable. 
And so I feel okay doing that. I don't think I'm violating any ethical norms or anything like that. So I feel okay about it, but it, I don't know. It kind of seems exploitative at some point. Kind of yeah. does. And that's, it seems that's intrusive. The word not that, intrusive, but yes. that's not the right word. But, you know, like something around there. It's like it's it's taking someone's trust in a way and saying, well, let, let me share this with other people who are kind of spectating. So it feels kind of icky, but I do the best I can to make it okay. Not icky. Yeah, yeah not icky. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think exploitative is the word that I want to avoid. I don't want my clients to feel exploited because yeah, it's a huge privilege to be let into someone's life and their pain and their trauma, right? So yeah, I definitely would not want people to feel exploited and I would not want it to come across like that either. So yeah, I think it's tricky. I'll let you know how I go though. I'll let you know what I've learned <laughs> next year in this process of writing a book. I and, would love that, yeah. Um, okay, yeah. so but would you ever say to a client... I just don't want her using, okay, so it says, I just don't want her using my quotes in a book she said she's going to write about what her clients say. That's pretty direct. Yeah. To and a that client. that says verbatim. Yeah, that's ver that says to me that yeah. you're using verbatim crap that I've said. I don't yeah. like that. I think if that you want like to use, yeah, to my okay. case study and then change, you know, details so that it, people don't know that it's me, Um, cool. But like, yeah, I think that's, yeah, to That's tell weird. to tell a client, I am collecting quotes from people like you that I'm meeting with. Basically, soup that feels very super icky to me, and in clinical terms, very super icky. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's a no no. I would say that's a no no. Yeah. Two wrinkles I want to add to this so far. Uh, I mm -hmm. wrote because I already knew about this ahead of time. You didn't. Clients are not a commodity <laughs> for our future endeavors, mm -hmm. and that's what yeah. this feels like to me was. Uh, this is that exploitative part, I think, yep. that could fit into that exploitation yep. sort of feel. Okay, so the other thing here is we. I, I would really encourage, like you said before, therapy is not friendship. And mm -hmm. don't get too, I would say don't get, coziness is fine, warmth is fine in a relationship, therapeutic relationship, but <laughs> don't get too cozy with your clients. Um, mm -hmm. They're not friends. It's not a paid mm -hmm. friendship. Mm -hmm. They are paying for us a service for us for a service, and mm -hmm. that's really what it boils down to: is we are providing a service. Mm -hmm. So I would really encourage my therapeers to stay within that like mental framework of what we're there for and what our role is, and that they're not a commodity. So yeah, mm -hmm. keep things professional, obviously, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I always ask myself too when I have that feeling of like. Um, if I'm about to do something or make a decision or um, something that involves clients, I'll ask myself or friends, anyone, what's my motive and what's my intention? Yeah. And nice. if I like had the thought, so I'll just sort of stop with the thought, pause it and then like examine it. So if I had the thought, um, you know, to say to a client like, oh, I did a podcast episode on polyvagal. You know, you should listen to it if we were talking about it in session, right? Before I say it, I will ask myself, what's my motive? You know, like, am I trying to shame them? Am I trying, you know, you just, you gotta, and this is friends, whoever, you gotta run it through your head first of like, why? What, what is the, why am I doing that? So I think with the, I wanna use your quotes in my book, what's the motive behind that? Yeah, there you go. But you gotta be willing to like, <laughs> be introspective and catch your thoughts as yeah. much as possible, yeah. That wraps it up for part one of the of this bad therapy two parter. If you want to hear more from Heidi, you can find her on Instagram at Heidi Rogers underscore or at her website, which is Heidi Rogers.com. I will have links to both of those in the description down below. She's got a whole bunch of resources for you, free ones. She's also got some webinars for sale and her flagship parenting program called Total Parenting Transformation. This is something that you actually have to sign up for ahead of time. So I would encourage you if you're if you're liking Heidi and you want to hear more about her parenting program, go over to HeidiRogers.com and sign up for the next round of it. But that is it for this episode. Bye. This podcast is not therapy, not intended to be therapy or be a replacement for therapy. 
Nothing in this creates or indicates a therapeutic relationship. Please consult with your therapist or seek for one in your area if you are experiencing mental health symptoms. Nothing in this podcast should be construed to be specific life advice. It's for educational and entertainment purposes only. More resources are available in the description of this episode and in the footer of justinlmft.com.